worship team. Appreciate them. Good. Hey, you want to take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 5? Turn around and bless somebody. All right. Good. Anybody got anything to be thankful to the Lord for? Anybody? Do you? Yeah. Good. Anybody got a specific thing that I could say? Anybody got a Pacific thing, right? Yeah, all right. Go ahead and stand up for a minute. First one ever in your life. Second one, 5K. Yay. Good deal. Amazing. How long have you been on your journey? A year and a half? Year or what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She never really tried to see how much weight loss she was doing. She just wanted to get healthier. But it's probably been close to 100 pounds, I would say, wouldn't you? 80, probably 80 to 100 pounds. And a uh, year-long struggle. And uh, I coordinated her the weight workout queen. And so now she really is a queen and she's good at it. But that's amazing, a 5K. Yeah, I, I haven't given her a crown. Can somebody buy her a crown? Yeah. Good. That's just amazing. Also, Sam's not here today, but she graduated college yesterday, didn't she? So that, that's amazing. Yeah. A lot of good things. Anybody else had anything you're thankful for at all? Go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you had a week worth of Mondays that ended in a car wreck, but you're still saying thank you, Jesus. That's amazing. Good. Anybody else? Enter to his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Yeah, good. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Megan, would you please stand up? Megan, uh, last week just really got saved when she was a kid. Some people struggle from that, right? Or, or don't struggle straight. And uh, last week, we've been talking a little bit behind the scenes. She would come to church. And last week said, I'm just giving my life to Jesus, right? That was Mother's Day. That's amazing. And then June the 5th, she's going to be baptized over in the sanctuary. We're going to do a baptismal service on June the 5th, okay? We just made it up. So the reason you never knew about it, because we just made it up. <laughs> It'll be over there, and that will be her son's birthday. So she's never going to forget when she gave her heart to the Lord on Mother's Day, nor when she got baptized, that'll be her son's birthday. And the great thing is, she makes sure her grandpa makes it to church. And... Uh, <laughs> So that's good. Bless you, Megan. We appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. There's two kinds of rough. There's rough without Jesus and rough with Jesus. Uh, and the rough without Jesus is different. It's like the rough will overcome you. Uh, and the rough with Jesus is we don't say that it's not rough. And if anybody tells you, okay, here's, here, yeah, yeah. If uh, we were talking last week and she was telling me about her day and I was going, dang, Jesus is good. Because if you didn't have him, you couldn't have made it through that one day. <laughs> right? uh, no, it was just, but rough, rough with Jesus does not mean it's not rough. It means there's an anchor in the midst of the rough. Right. So if you would have had your last week without Jesus, if you don't, you know, if you don't want to share, share as much as you want to. If you'd have had your last week without Jesus, what would you have done if you had not had Christ? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it actually exasperates it because when you wake up, you still have to deal with the mess that you got to, yeah, yeah. So, 
So, amazing. So what we're talking about in the background, I, I'm not calling it a series, but it's a thought in the back of my mind, is that there's prayer that invades the impossible. Right? So when there's an impossible circumstance, it's best to pray through the circumstance than to live through the circumstance without prayer. Okay? There's, and then that, that's, a, that's a survival. I call it defense living. Uh, sometimes you just got to play defense. Things are assaulting you, and the deal is you might not be thriving, but you live through it. And so you have to play. And then there's a switch of, to offense, okay? And that's when the thing is impossible, but I'm invading the impossible, right? And so it's a different... Appreciate that, amen. That was okay. I really, really like that. No, no, no it, it's, it's true. Uh, but... Both of them are very, sometimes there are things that are overwhelming me that are so impossible, I don't think I can live through it. Then there's something that I have to go through that's tomorrow or the next day or an hour from now, and it's impossible. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. You've lived through both of those, right? And what I want to talk about, what I'm just in the back of my mind over the last three or four weeks is is navigating that territory by praying into impossible things and asking somebody just be audacious enough to ask God to do something that's impossible with men. With men, it's impossible. That's what Jesus said. With men, it's impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. And Ron read one. Uh, it's, in, it's in the context of where I'm going to preach this morning. But uh, I really like Andrew. He's one of my favorite guys in the Bible. Philip, one of my favorite guys in the Bible. But uh, here, here's, here's what they say. The circumstance is completely impossible. What Ron read, read was 5,000 heads of household, which would actually mean 20,000 people. Because it means all their dependents. When they said sit down in rows, they were sitting down in family households. So when it says one guy sat down, all of his kids, his wife, and if he had a cousin uh, that his cousin had died, his cousin's kids. Does that make sense? In their culture. So it was heads of households. So it's probably 20,000 people. How, and Jesus said, sit them down. We're going to have dinner. And they said, what in the world are you talking about? And then they said two things. It was in hope, and there were 20,000, okay? And they go, number one is we don't have enough money to buy it. Number two, if we could, Dollar Store does not have enough food. <laughs> did, did you listen to what he read? He, what he said was, we don't have enough money. If we did have enough money, there is not a man-made supply chain that could fix this problem. What do you do in a situation like that? What do you do? Somebody said pray. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you pray. Okay. Uh, was it Philip? Uh, Philip is my guy. He just went and found a happy meal. <laughs> Five loaves, two fish. Handed Jesus a happy meal. He goes, here's what I got. And Jesus goes, great. I can do a lot with that. And actually, they fed the 20,000 and then had 12 baskets left over. How many disciples did Jesus have? Yeah, they, he, he fed everybody and then gave them what they needed for tomorrow with a happy meal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll take fries with that. <laughs> okay, and it'd be real interesting. I don't want to preach that message, but I'm already preaching it. Uh, <laughs> here's what happened. Here's what happened. Each one of them had an offering basket. They had a basket. And what Jesus did was he broke some food, put it in their basket. Uh, this was in the Bible. If Ron had a basket. Then when Ron went to his section, because Jesus was an organized man, the sun comes up in the morning, goes down at night. He created that. He's organized. All right. Uh, in that way, I am not like Jesus. Okay. He handed it to one of the disciples. Now, here's Ron. Ron's got an offering basket with bread in it. And when Ron went to his section, he just kept breaking it and handing it out. And I went, this is important. I want you to listen to what I have to say. The miracle actually happened in the hands of the server. The miracle did not happen in Jesus' hands. The miracle happened 
in the hands of the server. And uh, so what I want to talk to us about, about halfway through in a minute, is we need to be intentional blessers. It builds a landing strip for the Holy Spirit to land on. Okay? If there is no landing strip, the plane's not landing. But if we do natural serving, it gives opportunity for the Holy Spirit to land on that runway. Okay, uh, two kinds. We'll, I'll, I'll pick this out in a minute. We need to be intentional blessers. And I'm going to ask you to. I'm going to give you some homework. How many people in this room been blessed this week? Have you? You really like it? Molly and I this morning were just sitting in our morning prayer place and just thanking God for the blessings of this week. It was a good week for us and lots of good things. And we're just blessing the Lord. Okay, uh, you've been blessed this week. Okay, that deputized you in the kingdom of God to be a blesser for somebody else. If God blesses you, now you become a blesser. Here's what I want you to think about right now. And let the Holy Spirit interact. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't give you something, make something up. Okay? Because when I say, <laughs> when I say it, it'll make sense. Who could you bless this week? I want you to think. Now, if somebody comes to your mind, then that's it. That was the Holy Spirit that I want you to bless them. Okay. If nobody comes to your mind, just think about anybody because the Lord blesses everybody. Sun comes up for everybody, right? So I'll give you 30 seconds. Don't take much longer time than that or you'll overthink it. The Lord will bring somebody to your mind. You'll go, I'm going to bless. Oh, I can't bless them because of this. Well, why would I bless? And then now you'll go off here. Okay. So you just get, get them in your mind and go, that's the one right there. Okay. Okay. Now think about how you're going to bless them. Give them something. Do something for them. Uh, yeah, I just thought about something. I just thought if somebody wanted to bless me, uh, uh, I was going to tell you where I live because my grass needs mowed. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It really doesn't. I already mowed it. <laughs> but there is next week. Uh, no, okay. Either, either pray something, say something, do something, or give something. And your give something doesn't have to be big. Just give them something. Make them a cake, Okay. Do something for them. Just listen to the Holy Spirit. Dan did that. Our family was so blessed. And uh, finally, uh, that was a fun one because Dan makes this particular cake. I won't tell you what it is or you want him to make it for you. And I'm keeping it for me, okay? And it's just like amazing and our family loves it. And Dan made one. And so uh, uh, a couple days ago, yeah, a couple days ago, Molly just called all the kids in. And she said, eat this right now because I'm not eating any more of it. You guys eat it. And she handed it out and they ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> and they were blessed and she was blessed. It was a good day at the house. Okay? Now, I want you to think about somebody you can bless and intentionally say, I'm going after this one. Okay? Because there's two types of people that we bless. There's intentional blessing and then there's spontaneous blessing. And I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to bless. I'll show you in the Bible in just a minute. I'm going to bless. Lord, show me somebody, and he's given me something. There's something that I'm going to do for him. I'm on my way to do it. And then what can happen is other people come along, and it's just okay to bless them too. All right? Anybody ever been led to bless anybody? You just felt like the Lord said, say something, give something, do something, pray something for them. Have you ever been led to bless anybody? Okay, I have a question. Have you ever blessed anybody you weren't led to? Go ahead and try it. God will not be mad. When you get to heaven, God's not going to say, well, I didn't lead you to bless that person. Why in the name of me did you ever bless somebody that I did not lead you to bless? Do you think it's going to be like that? Huh? Uh, how about if I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to stop preaching and go into meddling. I'm going to meddle just for a few minutes. How about if some of the money God gave you weren't for you? How about if some of the money that God got into your life was not even for you? How about if some of the money God got into your life was actually for somebody else? And he got it to you so he could get it through you. 
And then he will lead you. Go ahead and do it. You want to blow a waitress away? Give a waitress a $100 tip. It will blow them away. And they'll go, you messed up. Why would you do that? And you'll go, it's because God was good to me and I'm being good to you. And he sees where you are. And he knows that you have a really hard struggle with your kids or whatever the thing is. And so today God is just like being super nice to you. Hmm? Okay. And then when you get to heaven, God's going to go, daggone it. I never told you to give her that $100. Why in the world did you do that? Do you think he'll do it? No, God is by nature a blesser. You were created in his image, right? And so if you just bless spontaneously, it'll be good. And then here's what the Lord will do. The Lord will show you as you interact with him who to bless spontaneously. And you'll just be walking around, the Lord say, encourage them with this word. Give them this here. Why don't you just go do that for them right there? And when you do it, it will create a platform that we can tell them how good God is. Is that okay? Uh-huh. That was way off of invading the impossible, but not real bad. Okay? Because we were talking about uh, what Ron read in the beginning about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Right? And that was just a spontaneous blessing. Jesus just goes, well, we got a 20,000 people crowd. I think I want to take them to lunch. And he did. Okay? That spontaneous blessing. It's scheduled. I'll show you in just a minute. Sometimes it is scheduled, and then sometimes it becomes spontaneous. How many scheduled people in the room you like order, and you like things to go on time? How many people, how many schedulers? Okay, how many spontaneousers? <laughs> Only three spontaneousers? We got to get some more spontaneous people. We need some drug addicts in our church. <laughs> they can be spontaneous. <laughs> okay, right? Which one is God? Come on, which one's God? How many of you believe that? Have you ever noticed that God will smash them together? It's called marriage. There'll be a spontaneous and there'll be a scheduled. Do you, you all have it? Who's the scheduled one? You? I could tell from here. <laughs> and there's a spontaneous. We do it too. I'm the scheduled one and Molly is so spontaneous. I just, it's hard on me. <laughs> Are both of them God? Do you believe they're both God? Huh? Do you have trouble if you're a scheduled person when God leads you into spontaneity? When you're a spontaneous person, is it difficult when God leads you into schedule? But is it God? Uh Uh-huh. And if God has called me, and he has because he saved me, if God has called me to be a blesser of other people, sometimes I need to set my goal on something. There's a somebody, God's put them on my mind, I'm after them, and I'm going to go bless them, right? Somebody else. My grandpa, anybody ever heard of dad jokes? My grandpa had a grandpa joke. A dad, a grandpa joke is a dad joke that got so old it's in the retirement home, and they are bad. Grandpa jokes are bad. When my dad started doing grandpa jokes, I said, Dad, we've been hearing these for three generations. Could you please just put a number on it? And if you put a number on it, we'll all give you a courtesy laugh, and we'll save like a half an hour. Just say three. We know what that joke is. We'll laugh. But my, my grandpa had a grandpa joke, and it was about a guy taking a guy duck hunting, and, and he goes, now don't just shoot into the crowd, aim at a duck. And so the ducks go by, and the guy never shot. And he goes, well, why didn't you shoot? He said, I was aiming at that one, but the others kept getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my grandpa joke. And, uh, but watch, but it really works. Is sometimes I'm headed to bless somebody, and the Lord brings somebody else in my way. And that doesn't mean don't pull the trigger. What that means, go ahead and bless them. Okay, I'll show it to you in, in the Bible in just a minute. I want to talk about this thing, and I want us to pray about it. Where, what the Lord will do, there's an impossible situation. He will lead people to pray into that impossible situation so that what's impossible becomes possible when it's handed to God. Isn't that good? That's that little happy meal that that little kid brought uh, and uh, can you imagine him going home telling mom and dad, 
<laughs> Mom, you remember this morning? You remember that? Yeah, I fed 20,000 people. Son, you are such an exaggerator. I've told you to stop that. No, this thing is like real. I gave it to this guy named Jesus and boom. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go ask anybody in town. <laughs> what about if instead of a happy meal, it was just a prayer? And I said, Lord, there's an impossible that that person is going through. I'm asking you to invade that impossible situation. Last week, we'd seen where it was a mom that came on the sake of her child. Remember the little girl that was demonized and nobody could get help? And she goes to Jesus, and the mom engages Jesus, and Jesus engages the girl, even though the girl is another place. Today, we're going to focus on one where it's a dad that prays for his daughter, and Jesus actually comes to his daughter. Okay? But the daughter does not, it is not the daughter's faith that engages the power of the Lord. It's the dad's faith that engages the power of the Lord on behalf of his daughter. What I want to use as a theme is there is faith that actually exploits crisis. And here's what I mean by that. There's a crisis. My life's going at this level. There's a crisis and the crisis threat is, at the end of the crisis, my life will be down here. Anybody ever went through a crisis? You're here, and then your life is down here at the end of a crisis. Anybody ever had it happen? Uh-huh. But with faith, here's what happens. Life's going along. Faith is invading the crisis. And after the crisis is over, actually, life is better than it was before the crisis came. And so in those cases, what happens is the crisis actually causes my life to elevate instead of going down. Yay. The crisis changed everything, and it's called a crisis of faith. And in the crisis, I chose faith, and on the other end of the crisis, actually life was better because faith invaded and exploited the crisis to make it better. So Mark chapter 5, we're going to see that happen. Two different cases. One's a man, one's a woman. Mark chapter 4 and 5 are one of my greatest uh, stretches of Scripture. One of my favorite stretches of Scripture. It shows Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. And it starts out with him calming a storm. Then there's a demonic guy nobody can help. Jesus heals him. Then there's a, a, a lady with the issue of blood. She's had it for 12 years, for a decade. She's, have a, she's had a medical problem. She's went to a doctor. She was rich. Now she's poor. She spent everything she had to get better, but she's not better. And it's totally exhausted. And she went from being the richest lady in town to a beggar, basically, if we wanted to say it like that. I don't know if she was richest, but she was very well off. Okay? Jesus heals her. Then the next one is somebody's dead. Uh, this Jairus' daughter, he raised her from the dead. And then Jesus feeds the 5,000. So I call him the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's the king over disaster, calms the sea. He's the king over disease, uh, the, the devil, the demonic, when the guy that has uh, the demons in him. Then he, you see him as the king over disease, one with the issue of blood. King over death, the little girl dies. And the king over deficiencies, there is no, not enough food and he provides that. Amen? And so in that stretch, we're going to see, uh, and we're going to jump in in Mark chapter 5. And we're going to look at prayer that invades the impossible. Because of faith that exploits crisis. Okay, are you with me? Yeah, let's read from the big Bible. 21, Jesus crossed over again to the boat to the other side. A great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Let me translate that. My daughter is on her deathbed about to breathe her last. What would you be like as a dad when you see your daughter so sick? Sick has now become she's about to die. And he is a ruler of the synagogue, which means he's anti-Jesus. Jesus is looked at as being a cult person. But you do anything when your baby's sick, right? And so he runs to Jesus, falls down, and says, We've been trying to kill you, but my daughter is sick. Could you come help her? Okay. And uh, 
saying, my little daughter's at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she'll live. What, what, what do you see that guy has right there? He has faith, doesn't he? What does he have faith Jesus can do? Heal his daughter. And what does he believe Jesus can do that will heal his daughter? Lay hands on her. Because there have been many testimonies of Jesus laying his hands on the sick and the sick healing. Being healed. Okay? That's an impossible situation. The daughter can't be helped by men. And so, and so now well, let's see what happens. So Jesus went with him. Say that. With him. So what's Jesus doing? Very scheduled and very intentional. What's he going to do? Go bless. Can we just say bless? Go bless. He's going to pray for them, right? So that's one of our four ways of blessing. He's going to go bless them. Okay? Let's see what happens. And Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Anybody here ever been in the Orient in a great multitude that throngs? You haven't? I've been in the Orient with great multitudes that throngs, like that right there. And it means their, their space is not American space, and so people will just press on you. Anybody been to India before? Anybody here been to India before? Yeah, uh, that's, and, and so crowds are not our crowds with Six inches, don't touch me. A crowds are this way. And I've been in the Orient a couple times where I wanted to go to that door right there. And the crowd was 10,000, 7,000, 5,000 people. You're going this way. And I wanted to go there, but I could not go there because the crowd took me here. Uh, how many people are getting claustrophobic right now? Uh huh. How many people are touching you when that happens? All of them. I'm telling you, it feels like all of them. They're all over, and one person's here, and one person's there, and then somebody will move, and then somebody else is touching, and all like that. That's important, because let's look at the, what it says. Uh, now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had suffered many things from physicians. She had spent all she had. She was no better, grew worse. But when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. Okay? For she said, if I only touch his clothes, I'll be made well. And immediately the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was, come on, healed. Okay. What did she have? Come on. Somebody say it. Whoever said it is exactly right, Tom. She has faith. What does she have faith in? Jesus, but what? If I can touch him, what did Jairus believe? If Jesus can touch her, this lady believes if I can touch him. Which one's right? Oh, you mean touching Jesus or Jesus touching me is both God just like scheduled and spontaneous is both God. And uh, please stay with me. 30 seconds. Please hear what I'm about to say. Some people come to church and say, if Jesus did not touch me, it must not have been his will to do anything for me. How about if you came to church going, I'm going to touch him. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm touching him. Right? So if Jesus doesn't touch me, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to touch him. Now, let me show you a power. This is really about half of what I want to preach. There is a tremendous power in that group. Actually, two competing powers. One power is what I call the power of passivity. There are all kind of people that are touching Jesus and nothing happens. They have no expectancy. They're not going after anything. They're just coming to church because mom made them. Life goes better with my wife. I go to church on Sunday morning. I go to church with my wife. It makes life easy. Right? And there's a lot of times people come into gatherings or around the presence of God and absolutely nothing happens. And when they go home, they go, I knew it was going to be like that. Because passivity is a great power that can quench faith. And I believe during COVID, there's been a great bit of passivity 
uh, that has been, uh, what, what's another word for it? That has been thrown out. I'm not just talking about spiritual, where people are almost numb. They're neither, they're neither angry, they're not sad, they're not mad, they're just numb. They're just making it through the day, going through the motions, and it is a spirit uh, of passivity that says people are touching Jesus, but nothing's happening. Do you see that right there in the Bible? Watch this. Okay, here it goes. Uh, look in verse 30. She touches Jesus. She starts, uh, she is instantly healed. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that what? Do you, can you see that? Power did what? Went out of him. Why? Because, go ahead and say it real loud, Tina. Because she touched him with faith. When she touched him with faith, it was different than all the people that are touching him. So Jesus is in this throng like this. They're going to Jairus' house. And all of a sudden, he stops the crowd and says, get away from me. Stop. Somebody touched me. And in the other version, one of the disciples says, what do you mean somebody touched you? All kinds of people are touching you. And Jesus goes, no, this is different. I felt power leave me. Now, that's very interesting to me, and I don't know how it works, but I know it works, is I feel it when the Lord touches me. And I've had the Lord heal me before many different things, and I felt it when it was different, and I had no range of motion. My knee was one of them. I had no range of motion, and somebody prayed for me, put their hand on my knee, and instantaneously I had full range of motion when all I had was 30% range of motion. I felt that happen instantaneously. I never thought about this, but it's in the Bible, is Jesus felt it when he healed me because power left him and touched me. And faith made the connection between the two. Watch this. Faith believes in somebody, but faith believes for something. If you take notes, that's actually a note. That's a point. Faith faith is not passive. It believes in someone for something. I'm, I'm not generally praying, God bless my day, or if I'm blessing somebody, I'm praying for Brian. I'm not saying, Lord, uh, I may just say, Lord, bless Brian, but, I, but then I pray, Lord, do this for Brian. Lord, bless his children with a job, God. Make his life easy, God. Okay, Whatever it is I'm praying for, I'm praying to someone for something. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. And so other people that are touching Jesus, there is no faith involved. They are not. Be- I, I, I heard a lady, and uh, she had tried uh, for years to get sober. She couldn't get sober. And uh, she really was trying with everything she had. And she came and, and uh, uh, she had some years of sobriety. I said, what was the difference? And she said, there were two things. Number one, she said, I made friends with somebody that I couldn't BS. Those are her words, not mine. Okay. That I couldn't mess with them. And she goes, and I started praying a prayer. And here was my prayer every day. My prayer was God, keep me sober today. And she said, the old gruff lady that I couldn't be us told me, you need to bow your knee and pray to God every day that he'll keep you sober today. And, she'll, and she goes, God doesn't need me to bow. And she goes, no, God doesn't need you to bow, but you need to bow. So every morning you get up in the morning and you bow and you say, God, keep me sober today. And my experience with her when I talked to her, she said, for, and for, for two years, he's been keeping me sober every day. Now, that's a good prayer. It's praying to someone, what? For something. And so what did the woman who had the issue of blood, what did she want? Uh huh. And so when she reached out and told everybody else, Jesus is amazing. He's here. He might do some stuff. That'd be cool. But, but everybody else is just touching him. But what does she? She's believing someone, what? For Something. And, and then here's the second point. Faith engages Christ and faith engages the crisis. My faith actually engages the crisis I'm going through. And my faith engages Christ and it draws Christ into my crisis. 
that okay? So why is Jesus walking down the road? Because Jairus, we'll call him Jairus, Jerry, it's easier to say. Because Jerry, we got a Jerry, okay? Because Jerry asked him to. Now all the people are following. Now he stops and he asks the lady and the lady goes, I touched you. And he goes, yeah, I felt it come out of me. And then he goes, your faith has made you whole and uh, we're going to jump in. Uh, uh, and he looked around to see who touched him. 33, the woman fearing and trembling, his faith has made you whole. Go to 33 for me, uh, Paige. Who has done this? And the woman, fearing and trembling, uh, 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. When he says go in peace, that's go into peace. Go into a new realm called peace. I pray that for you guys. May we go into a new realm called peace. Whatever realm we came into today, may God touch us that we go into a new realm called peace. Go in peace, your faith has made you whole, and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, one of Jairus' uh, uh, servants, who's been watching the daughter that was sick, comes, and now we'll look what she, he says. Your daughter is no longer sick. She is dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Come home. And when he gets home, here's what they find. They've already called the funeral home. They have local mourners. They've already called the mourners. And they, at home, they're working on setting up the funeral. I don't know about you, but I felt like this. Right when the Lord was on the way to help me, somebody else interrupted him. And when he should be at my house, he's at somebody else's house. And I went to church and everybody else got blessed and I left. And I wasn't so blessed and I was the preacher and I should have got it first. But... That's what Jairus would feel like. But while Jesus is on the way was scheduled, all of a sudden spontaneous comes. And being God, he just starts dealing with spontaneous instead of scheduled. And uh, Jairus, well, my prayer didn't get answered. He's about to go to his house. And it's real interesting. I love it in the book, book of Luke. And Jesus says this. He goes, don't you be afraid. You keep on believing. I'm going to heal your daughter. And let me show you how things get better. It's the worst crisis of his life. But at the end of the crisis, his life is better than it was before the crisis began. That's amazing. It's the worst crisis that could happen. His own child dies. That's the worst day that a human being can experience. At the end of the day, the day is actually better than it was before the crisis happened. There are three points. I'll give you the points and we'll say amen. Okay? But here's what I want you to say. See, Jairus woke up in the morning believing Jesus could heal the sick. Did you see that? Just come to my house. You can heal her. Watch. He went to bed that night knowing Jesus could raise the dead. He went to, woke up that morning believing Jesus could heal the sick. Let me get Jesus to my daughter and Jesus can heal her. He went to sleep that night if he could have slept that night believing that Jesus can raise the dead. Yay. What happened in the midst of his crisis was his faith that exploits crisis. Actually, his faith was elevated in the crisis, not drowned. Every crisis you go through is going to challenge your faith and you will come out of the crisis with your faith elevated or with your faith overwhelmed. You will overwhelm the circumstance with faith or the circumstance will overwhelm your faith. The difference is believing someone for something. If the something is altered, keep believing the someone. So she dies, and now Jairus says, there's no more hope. And Jesus goes, I'm still here. Come here, boy. And Jesus goes home and resurrects his daughter, and his daughter comes back to life. And then Jesus, it's in uh, 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 Luke's, I think. Then it says, and Jesus handed her to him. That's a good one, isn't it? See, I told you. 
<laughs> All right. I want to talk about three points and make sure that I get them right. You guys okay? I'm not going to go deep. I just want you to remember them. Number one. In the midst of faith that exploits crisis, crisis will take our faith beyond its present ability. So you stay with the Lord on the other end of the crisis because I'm contending for the impossible. When the impossible comes on the other end, uh, our uh, level will be higher. Number two, there's contention points, two contention points. Believing what God can do and believing what God will do will challenge one another. There will be a believing what God can do versus a believing what God will do. How many people believe God can do anything? We'd all raise our hand. How many people believe God will do something impossible for me today? And we go, I don't know about that one. Right? And what happens, what he's challenged with, I believe Jesus can heal the sick. Oops, he didn't do it. I believe what God can do. And now what's going to be elevated is his believing what God will do. And Jesus goes, not only can I heal the sick, I can raise the dead, and I'm still coming with you. And it is not what I can do, it's what I will do. Does that make sense? Okay, number last. Yeah. Uh, number three is Jairus has two voices. Jesus said, I'm coming, and somebody else says, this is too difficult. Somebody else says, your daughter is already dead. There will always be, when there's a faith that is invading the impossible, there will be a point where I will believe what God said over what someone else is saying. And often what will happen, and everybody in this room that's been saved more than a couple of years, have had moments where you came up against an obstacle. Somebody else said, this is not going to work, A, B, C, D. But deep inside your spirit, you knew it was going to work out right. How many people has that had happen? And it worked out right because I was believing what God said as opposed to believing what someone else said. So the crisis points, three crisis points with faith that uh, exploits crisis is uh, the crisis of my present faith versus the faith that I will have on the other end. So the crisis will cause my faith to be elevated. Is that good? Am I saying it good enough for the note takers now? And there will be a believe what God has said versus believing what someone else has said. And there will be the crisis of the crisis point of uh, believing what God can do versus what God will do. That makes sense. I fight with faith, contend, keep praying, keep believing on those three points when I am asking God, or God and I are working together in this thing, I'm asking God to do those things which are impossible. Sometimes it's for me. The lady was contending for herself when she touched him. How about Jairus? Sometimes it's for somebody else. Sometimes it's me touching God. Sometimes it's God touching me. If God doesn't touch me, I touch him. Sometimes that praying for the impossible will be I'm praying for somebody else. Sometimes it will be I'm praying for me. Does that make sense? Not, not an evangelist fiery uh, service this morning, but a good pastoral, go deep, learn something and be able to walk in it. All right? Good. How many people have an impossible circumstance that would be really nice for God to touch? Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah? All of us do, don't we? Okay. You mind to stand together? We're going to let our worship team come. And if you want to, there are people on your each side. If you want to, you could grab their hand and pray for one another. You could put your hand on their shoulder if you're nice. If, if you don't want them to touch you, just do this right here. That means, and, and act like you're already praying. You bow your head, you close your eyes, you put your hand in front. That means don't touch me. 
all right? If you're not in a don't touch me mode, and if you see somebody that's doing that, grab, no, don't. <laughs> you grab them, they really need it. No, <laughs> no, you see somebody, no, some people just don't like to be touched. I'm one of them, I understand. My buddy said, uh, you always tell people to hold hands, you never hold hands. I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the person on your right, I want you to pray for them. Just, you can pray out loud, you can pray on the inside if you want. And what you're praying is, Lord, impossible situations for them, we're asking you to invade them. Would you do for them, you don't have to know what it is God does. Would you do for them what nobody else could do? Lord, throughout this room, there's all kinds of circumstances and situations where we need the God of the impossible to break through. We need the Jehovah Parazim to break in in circumstances that no man can help or handle. And now for our friends, we're doing like Jairus. We're just, we're just praying for them, that you would touch them. We're bringing them to you and you to them. We're asking that you would invade the impossible on their behalf. And now there's somebody on your left hand. And we're going to take a second and pray for them. Lord, I thank you for my friend. I thank you for how you've been good to him. We come into the goodness of God, the favor of God, the faith of God in this place right now. May there be more that happens in the synergy of our praying together than there is on the struggle that they've been uh, like, or it just seems like they're by themselves. You said if two or more of us would gather and touch one thing, that it would be done, that the Father might be glorified through the Son. So we just pray for them. We ask that you would invade their impossible. Lord, we pray you'd bring physical healing in this room. We pray that you'd bring financial breakthrough, that you'd bring provision and blessing. Now, there's somebody that's not here. You might want to pray for them. Lord, there's somebody that's not here that is in an impossible situation or a friend here that's in a possible situation. Lord, we just invaded on their behalf and we ask that you would come through as the God who breaks in in the impossible. And we asked earlier, and nearly everyone in the room said, I've been in impossible situations before that God broke through. We ask that now you would touch those in Jesus' name. Our worship team's going to sing. We're going to sing together with them. I'm going to stand down front. And there may be someone just wants to come and say, would you join with me in prayer about this circumstance? Or there might be someone that says they want to give their life to Christ. They want to join faith. And so uh, as our worship team comes, I'll stand down. You feel free to come. Mm-hmm.